All right, today we're going to talk about the deadlift. Everything about the deadlift. This is the master class. We're going to talk about one of the best exercises for your body, how to do it, prerequisites, cues, everything. So welcome to the deadlift master class. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, go. Yeah, let's do it. You know, these master class videos we've been doing, we get a lot of really good uh, reviews. A lot of people saying they're doing, they're, they're benefiting from them, both trainers and clients and everyday people alike. So mm -hmm. we did body parts. Um, and it makes sense that we would talk about some of the, the exercises that uh, we think to be the best ones that are out there. Yeah, dude, and just a bigger, deeper dive into the subject. Absolutely. Sure. But yeah, the deadlift is known as one of the big three or big four or big five exercises. You'll, you'll hear people refer to strength training exercises like that. And it's always in, it's always in a list, right? It's always one of the big lifts. And the reason for that is because uh, people have identified now because people have been deadlifting for decades. It's not a new exercise. It's one of the oldest exercises out there, but people have identified that it's incredibly valuable for almost any goal. Or if I can't think of a goal, it wouldn't be valuable for. It's definitely valuable for real world strength, muscle building, and then uh, fat loss as a result of the metabolism boost that it comes from functionality, mobility. Uh, it's just across the board, um, it's valuable. It's a valuable exercise. It's one that everybody should do. And if you can't do it, get to a place where you can do it. Well, I think that the squat has been touted as the king of all exercises for the longest time, mm. but I, I would like to argue that the deadlift is. Mm -hmm. I think that um, you get as much of a full body activation. Uh, you get just as big of bang for your buck when it comes to CNS and overall total body. And then on top of that, when we understand as trainers, one of the, the biggest things you're trying to combat is uh, posture issues with people, like with the rounding of their shoulders, the forward head, the, the closing of their body, in the, and the weakening of all the muscles in the posterior chain. Yes. So that's what that's caused from, right? You get really weak muscles in the posterior chain. You get this uh, over usage, tightening and shortening of the muscles in the anterior, so in the front of the body, and we're rounding for it. It's why when you look at people that are 70, 80, 90 years old, they've got these walkers and they're rounded mm -hmm. over. And a lot of that is because that posterior chain is just destroyed. It's weak. It's completely weak. They're disconnected from it. And the deadlift is the best exercise yeah. for the entire posterior chain. So... I would argue that it is a more important and even better exercise when you talk about the king of all exercises. Yeah, it's definitely uh, debatable for sure. Um, I, I think you would get people who would agree with you. I, I think they're both extremely valuable exercises, definitely top two, and you could switch them if you want. Um, but I would say in terms of uh, application to modern life, everyday life, I would agree because you're more likely, A, to pick things up like that, well, that's, that's, yeah, that was kind of the direction I was going after that was like, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you got to lift something heavy, like in terms of load squats, you're going to do probably more frequently in terms of a movement pattern. I, like I might argue of, like yeah. getting up and down from a chair, like, you but know, usually toilet. Not with load. yeah, but usually not with load. And so in a loaded situation where you actually have to pick something up and have the strength uh, and organize your body in such a way to do that mechanically sound, a uh, deadlift teaches you how to do that. Yeah. And when we refer to the posterior chain, that literally is referring to pretty much all the muscles of the back of your body. Okay. So think of your back, then think of your glutes, your hamstrings, and your calves. So from your ankles up to essentially the bottom of your neck, uh, those would be the, mu the muscles of posterior chain. And they are, most of the muscles in our bodies are underused in modern uh, societies, but the posterior chain in particular is, uh, isn't used very often. And, uh, the most common complaint for pain, if you look it up, uh, revolves around the back and in particular the low back deadlifts, if done, uh, appropriately and properly and trained properly, there isn't an exercise that would bulletproof your back, your low back in particular, like deadlifts. So long as they're performed properly, this is one of the best exercises you could do well into old age that would strengthen your back to the point where you would really prevent low back injury, which almost everybody at some point uh, will, will complain of or, or suffer from. My healthiest advanced age clients could deadlift well. Always. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the fittest advanced age clients that I had uh, had a healthy, strong lower back and they had a healthy, strong lower back because they had the ability to deadlift. Whether they gain that ability later in age because they were taught mm -hmm. and they developed that strength or something that they kept throughout their entire life. Either way, 
you could definitely narrow down the the healthiest, fittest, strongest, advanced age clients I had were deadlifting. They yes. had that ability. Now, um, you'll you'll never you almost never hear the argument that deadlifts aren't beneficial for athletics. I think um, athletes and strength coaches uh, realize its benefit, or at least a version of deadlift. Well, now they do. They yeah. do now. Right? That used to be a, a lot of discussion and debate uh, in the programming of athletic um, um, sports uh, in terms of that being something that's going to make them more muscle bound or whatever the excuse was at the time was that they didn't find the the relevance of deadlift uh, in terms of moving fast or like they did uh, squats. Yeah, yeah. Having explosive right. strength. But right. these days, you I mean, everybody probably would of agree course. And, and, and or some version of it. Right. But in the muscle building world, there's still, and this is silly to me, there's still sometimes a little controversy over the deadlift. <laughs> Only in the uh, bodybuilding world. Yeah, like it's not the best back exercise to develop the back. And you know, I'm going to tell you where the roots of that come from, uh, 100%. The roots of that do not come from the fact that bodybuilders have noticed it doesn't build a great back. It's false. Bodybuilders who perform deadlifts will tell you this is one of the best muscle building exercises. It comes from bodybuilding uh, workout planning and programming itself because it is not an easy exercise to plug in yeah. to a body part split routine. Where do I put it? Back day, leg day. Uh, I don't do back and legs on the same day. Like, where, how do I? So they all, and it works so many muscles and it doesn't isolate something. And it's, and it's me, hard. And it's yeah. hard. And so <laughs> I can row, I can pull, I could do all these other back exercises. It, it, it's totally baloney. It's funny too because the most, some of the most uh, winningest champion bodybuilders uh, will talk about how deadlifts were were so great at developing the back. Yeah, the for the Ron, average person, the, Ron, the Ronnie Coleman's, yeah, the Seabum does them the now. Arnold Seabum, yeah. like uh, your best, some of your best body bodybuilders and physiques deadlifted, which is Stan uh, and be, which is really weird to me. Uh, Stan effort. You you have these people that are famous and they all did that, uh, that yet there's this culture in the last decade or two that, you know, have decided to eliminate deadlifting in their, their bodybuilding programming. It's so wild to me. Yeah. No, the best, the per personally, the best gains I ever made, um, were when my deadlift got stronger always. Yeah. And with my clients and I trained everyday people, I didn't train a lot. I trained very few people who you would consider hardcore. It was always average people. And I had all of them deadlift. Every single one dead, that could deadlift. And the ones that couldn't, we worked towards the ability to do so. And it didn't matter their age. And all of them, when they got stronger in the deadlift, it was, uh, it, it was, it was pronounced in terms of their posture, the strength, the muscle. I would see fat loss. So, um, you know, I, I, we're making the case essentially for why this is included is one of the most important exercises. Um, now there's, there's two, when we say deadlift, this is one of those few exercises where there's two distinct versions, but they're both referred to as a deadlift. And sometimes people use them interchangeably mm -hmm. and say, I deadlift, I deadlift. And then you have to ask them specifically, well, what, how do you deadlift? Is it conventional or is it sumo? sumo. This is because of powerlifting, mm -hmm. the sport of powerlifting. One <clears> of the, <throat> one of the major lifts, cause they compete with three lifts, bench press, deadlift, and squat. The deadlift can be performed both sumo or conventional, and it doesn't matter which one you do. You can pick, and then that's the deadlift version that you do, and, and your weight counts just like someone else's weight counts regardless of uh, if they do conventional or sumo. Um, I, I, there's definitely some similarities, but I don't consider them to be the same exercise. I, they're, I would, they're different enough. No, they're. I think they're a lot different. I think it's uh, almost as different as comparing a back squat to a front squat. Uh, yeah, I, I could see some of that. Definitely. I mean, you have very, you have obviously you have some of the same muscles yeah, that, are, that yeah. are, that are activating. Okay. But they're different enough that, I mean, it's that, that different right. that uh, I, and anybody who's done a back squat and a yeah. front squat, how different they feel. Totally different uh, recruitment pattern that you're firing yeah. off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For each one of those yeah. exercises. Now both, but both are very posterior chain. Yeah. Uh, heavier dependent. posterior loaded. Yeah. yeah. So people ask which one to pick. That's why, that's where I was going. And I think everybody should do both. I do. I think you should practice both of them. You will find that one of them you'll be better at than the other. And this is why people have favorites. Some people do better in one. Some people do better in the other. But I think it's it's a good idea to probably um, you know practice both. My versions. my general advice for clients, um, regardless if you're in in the powerlifting community or not, is you you have one that you're naturally going to be better at. Everybody's going to right. That's just going to feel more natural. 
So you spend 80% of your time trying to get strong in that yeah. because getting stronger in that lift is going to have so much bang for its buck that I wouldn't uh, intentionally be switching back and forth all the time uh, with the, the two, but I would interrupt it 20% of the time with the opposite. That's a good number. So it's just a kind of generic advice that I give somebody. It's like, there's so much value and they're different enough that to not do the other one, just because you're not good at it all, you're missing out on some potential gain. So at least introduce it enough that it interrupts the way that you choose to do it most of the time. Yeah. So essentially a conventional deadlift is your hands are outside your feet. It's a more narrow stance and a sumo, your feet are outside of your hands and it's a wider stance. Some people can go real wide. Um, I, I, I would say for general training purposes, a, a, you know, kind of moderate wide stance. Sometimes people go crazy to limit the range of motion for competition right. uh, purposes. Personally for me, Adam, um, I've gotten through a few sticking points with my conventional by by getting better at the sumo. Mm. So I noticed that obviously that I got stuck here. Let me practice sumo for a little while. Went back to my conventional and I was able to break through a plateau. This is an area, this is also why I compared it to the front and back squat. Yeah. I feel the same way about that. Yes. Like there's been times when I've been back squatting, back squatting, back yep. squatting. And then I'm like, you know what? I haven't interrupted that with a good like training mm -hmm. cycle of front squatting. And let me get, and then let me, since I'm stuck at this back squat right here, let me get really mm -hmm. good at front squatting, see what happens. And many times what ends up happening is I get stronger in the front squat. I go back to the back squat and I see myself get stronger yeah. again. I feel the same way about whatever way you, whether it's conventional or sumo that you traditionally do the most with. When you hit a plateau, one of the great ways to kind of break through that plateau is to switching to the other for a, enough of a cycle that you watch yourself get stronger in that one and then come back over and there is carryover. Today's program giveaway maps power lift. Here's how you can win the program. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. And if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale on some workout programs this month. The first one is our, our beginner strength training program, Map Starter. That's half off. Then we have a bundle that includes Maps Anabolic and Maps Prime called the Starter Bundle. That's also 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Right. Now, this is the probably the only exercise I can think of where the grip really becomes a conversation as you get stronger at this lift. Now, when you first start out, not a problem. You grab the bar, practice your deadlifts, get better at it, not an issue. But because the strength potential for the deadlift, for most people, okay, most everyday people, working out, strength training, following traditional exercises, the most weight you'll lift will be in the deadlift. You're probably, your potential for strength yeah. is probably highest. I say probably because there's the outliers, but you're probably highest with the deadlift. And that means that you have to hold on to most weight you could possibly lift with your hands. And so the grip- Which can, is usually the limiting factor for a lot of people. For a lot, especially nowadays, because nobody, everybody, nobody challenges their hands anymore. So- they go to pull 100 pounds off the floor, not a problem. It gets up to 200, 300. Now, all of a sudden, I think I could lift it, but my hands can't hold it type of deal. So aside from allowing your grip to strengthen over time, which is important, there are a couple strategies. One is known as the over-under grip, and this does dramatically increase the amount of weight you can hold on to. So this is where you'll see a power lifter where one hand will be facing forward and one hand will be facing back. And that improves the, um, that increases the amount of weight you can lift because it prevents the, as the bar, the bar doesn't roll out essentially is what's happening. And you're able to lift more. Now, the consideration with that is make sure you alternate which hand is facing forward right. every set. I made this mistake uh, as uh, a yeah. lifter because I felt stronger with my right hand supinated. And then eventually that's where I did all my heavy sets. Yeah, you favor it at that point, right? And I developed an imbalance in my back, which you could, I could actually visibly see and feel. Um, and it took me, I don't know, I don't know, two and a half, three years to be able to reverse that, uh, that imbalance. So if you do an over under grip, make sure every set you alternate. So you don't end up developing an imbalance because it will develop an imbalance if, if one hand is always supinated for, for GP, I would say I would just tell that person to just do double overhand. I don't see a lot of value in that unless there's, unless like we're chasing a PR that week or something like, let's say I have a client, right? Um, that is that I'm, I'm really trying to, let's say it's one of my female clients who I'm really trying to encourage her to lift heavier, lift heavier, lift yeah. heavier. And, you know, we, we've been training, you know, deadlifting for a while and the limiting factor tends to be her, her, you know, double overhand grip. And like, she's, she can't hold on the bar. Maybe that client, because I'm pushing that message so hard. 
um, you know, I, I have a set where I let her do the uh, over under. But for most clients, like I don't see a lot of value. It's when in, the grip becomes an issue. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and Justin has said this before plenty of times. You've made a case for it. I was the one when I was bodybuilding that was utilizing straps. And that's a whole nother conversation on like where that is ap applicable. But for the average person who is just mm -hmm. trying to get in shape, get strong, get fit, um, I, I would encourage trying to get strong double overhand. You're going to have the least get amount. Get as far of, as you can go, for yeah, sure. Yeah, get yes. as far as you possibly can and, and get technique down. There's no reason. If you're just learning the deadlift, it's your first year of doing it, and you're already doing switch grip and you adding wraps. No. Like, it's just like you have so much potential to get stronger and to work on all those things first before – implementing something like that just to increase say 25 to 50 pounds on the bar uh for the deadlift that's just my yeah my if you're yeah, I could if, get on board with if that. you've got good mobility and you're able to progress consistently you, you, i would agree with you You probably have at least six months to a year before you'd have to use any kind of grip strategy mm -hmm. then you can do the over under hook grip that's what i prefer now because there's no way to be to develop an imbalance because both hands are facing forward and it's it's a hook grip is what olympic lifters use where you wrap your finger around your thumb Uncomfortable, difficult. Yeah, yeah. That I takes a lot of practice. I try to get yeah. good at that, and I just, did. You ever get good at that? No, never good. I've I've practiced and practiced and practiced, and it's just one of those that never stuck. I gave up. Yeah. I've gave up every time. Every yeah, time that I wanted I've to do, try it. to stick to it for a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I just being honest, I I didn't stick it out because it just hurt. It hurt, and I sucked at it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to stick. Yeah, so I you I, stuck I, it out for. Like I a year. I do it. I do it every single time. I still can't. you didn't though before. No, when we first met, you it were you, you were over under guy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Now, now to truth be told, so this was now you're looking at, I've been practicing now lifting heavy with the deadlift hook grip probably for, I don't know, five years, six years. And uh, still, if I want to go to my top, top, top set over under, it, I can hold more weight still. And in fact, yesterday or two days ago, I tried to deadlift and I was pulling five, I was trying to go for 585 or 570. And I tried double overhand uh, with a hook. And I lost the bar at the top, but I could have held it with a, uh, with a oh, you know, runner. Yeah, I see. So even now that's still my strong. So has grip. the, has the hook grip, uh, ever, has it got to a place where it's comfortable for you or is it uncomfortable still? Really? I mean, it doesn't like, it's not like when I first did it where I was like, Oh, this really hurts. Yeah. Still not comfortable. It's still not, it's still not super comfortable No, but it doesn't hurt. So, but it does take practice, a lot of practice. And then mm -hmm. we talked about straps, wrist straps. I don't like wrist straps for most people because most people should be able to, Use either one of the strategies we talked about or, or develop a stronger grip. I could see uh, high volume bodybuilding training. That's the only place. Use, that's yeah. the, that's yeah. the point. When I was training twice a day, yeah, seven days sets, a week, yeah. and I'm doing all these sets and I'm targeting very specific yeah. small Look, muscle. Not quite as high either. Yeah, and, I, and I'm targeting a very specific muscle group. I don't want the forearms to get involved in it at all and or, or I, it, maybe I'm fatigued from the day before from going really heavy and I don't want that to hinder yeah. my rear delt work and so yeah I, I use straps a lot when I was bodybuilding but it wasn't just so I could get a heavier deadlift it was for that but that purpose mm -hmm. is like I don't want my forearms to limit me from these other things that I'm doing and I had so much training volume and it was and at that point I don't care when I get up on stage, the judges don't go, "Hey, how's your grip strength compared to that guy's?" Yeah. They are looking at your body, and right. if, if if and if that gave me an advantage to sculpting my body, um, I was going to use that advantage, even if I know that for you know real world strength, overall help, general population, that's not ideal. There's that's where the exception to the rule. Yeah, comes. and also it also does change a little bit of the recruitment pattern up in the kind of shoulder area. Mm -hmm. People think that's not that big of a deal, not that important. Well, if you're a everyday average person and you can develop more grip strength, I don't think it's a good idea to go that route, uh, to develop recruitment patterns where your, your body learns how to lift more weight without necessarily using its grip the way it should type of deal. Well, this no. is why I would say the bodybuilders are probably the only place. Yeah. And you're creating a, a weak stress point, yep. uh, that is going to be completely not ideal in the real world. If you're grabbing something that is <clears throat> equal in weight to what you normally would lift with like a strap, uh, you know, where is all that going to go right to your stress point that's going to break? So, you know, something that we don't actually talk a lot about um, in, in regards to getting, a, a, you know, doing this like grip uh, overhand for deadlift and, and the real, like some really cool benefits. The strongest I ever was in uh, like total lifts, all my lifts was when I had the heaviest and I was the strongest deadlifter. And I attribute some of that, at least some of it, to I had the that was when my greatest grip strength was yeah. 
and and I got the best development in my grip just simply lifting heavy deadlifting. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you, not doing a bunch of crazy the cool things you can do. Not doing a bunch of forearm exercises that we know that are out there that are will help your grip strength. And I didn't do any of that stuff. I just got held really, on to a heavy bar. I right? held on to a heavy ass bar and mm -hmm. got and I did it frequently for it over a year consistently and I watched my all my other my overhead press mm -hmm. my bench press all my other exercises came up with that and you have to think that that ha having a really really strong grip has carry over into all lifts that you hold on to a think barbell of, or dumbbell think of any upper body exercise just to hammer this home right think of any upper body exercise envision yourself doing it. I don't care what it is curls press downs overhead press bench press, whatever now imagine you having a weak grip on the bar now imagine having a strong grip on the bar. You're just more connected. Yeah. You're able to lift more weight. You're able to uh, do more power output. The, your hands connect you to the world. This is what humans are most known for, right? Our opposable thumbs and our ability to articulate our fingers and manipulate objects. Very strong, capable hands translates across the board. And so. for that reason, that's enough reason to stick to the double overhand, get strong, yeah. because I would rather uh, lift a little less weight double overhand, but have stronger forms than use straps or have to go over under just so I could say my deadlift is stronger. I care more about that my over my forearm strength because then that was going to contribute to all the other movements. Yeah, and your hands will catch up. It just takes a little bit of time. Yeah. That's for sure. So um, let's talk a little bit about the requirements or kind of things you want to be able to do or have to be able to perform a deadlift. Um, number one, you want to be able to what's called hip hinge. Okay. So most people who've never deadlifted, they know if I say something like, uh, don't lift that with your back, lift it with your legs or lift it the right way. They can picture like their dad, what they told them to do or whatever, where you kind of keep your back straight and mm -hmm. stick your butt out and bend over rather than rounding your back. That's kind of what we mean by hip hinge. You can bend over by hinging at the hips or you can bend over by rounding your spine. You do not deadlift by rounding your spine. You deadlift by hinging at the hips. This sounds to some people like, oh, that's cool. No big deal. I'm going to tell you right now, one of the, it was one of the more challenging things to get a person to understand who didn't work out. When I would get a new client, oftentimes we'd have to really practice and feel what it feels like to actually hinge at the hips because most of us don't do that throughout the day. Well, yeah, you oh, have yeah. to point out that, you know, if you're most people, if they pick something off the floor, they do not hinge. They round. Yeah. They round. Like, so if there was, there's, which by the way, this is like some of the most common injuries in clients was like picking a shampoo bottle up, pulling a little weed out. And it's the, and that's that rounding. They weren't loading the hips to mm -hmm. pick a shampoo bottle. They weren't loading the hips to pull a weed out. So like that, they're rounding at the back and jerking on someone like that and then ends up hurting themselves. So it's actually a really um, unnatural thing to do for most people, mm -hmm. unless you have been taught proper hinging most people are. one of my favorite ways to teach this and the, hopefully the guys when they do the edit right here will show this video because i know i did a youtube video a long time ago on mind pump tv and that's the pvc pipe yep. yeah yep. right that was that technique i don't remember where i got that from first or who taught that to me but was such a game changer because there's so many cues involved uh, that you're trying to tell a client who doesn't understand how to hinge, who also can't see or really feel their body mm -hmm, like that mm -hmm. way, uh, and that you're trying to tell them that they just learning that just was such a struggle. The first three to five years of my career trying to teach a hinge was so difficult that many times I abandoned it because I was not good at teaching it. That PVC pipe really brought it all together with me. And yeah. that's where you run that PVC pipe down the spine and they keep the head, upper back and, and low back all connected to the PVC pipe as they bend over. And if they just concentrate on those three points, It'll, they'll hip hinge. They'll yeah, have so to you get the nodule, you get between the shoulder blades, yep. you get down there, you know, kind of near the butt cheeks yep. and you just try to maintain those contact points. Uh, and, it, and it teaches them to keep that nice firm back and, and everything kind of accounted for. But yeah, it's such an unnatural thing. You're either going to get them rounding the back to pick something up or they squat this weird squat down where their heels will They're come up. Over, yeah, yeah, and then their knees will protrude forward. And yeah. so, you know, like you kind of have to work through all of that, like, you know, keeping the knee kind of in a locked position and, and supported. But now we're like sliding our hips back. One of my cues was like to karate chop those hips. So we're just imagining somebody kind of like chopping your hips back. Mm -hmm. The next one would be to have a stable and strong core. Why? Because what you don't want with a deadlift is to have a really, really weak core and really, really bad 
low back support. This is where you hear the, the horror stories of people hurting their low backs when they deadlift. Now, I want to be very clear. If you perform a deadlift properly and appropriately, in other words, you got good technique, good stability, you're using a weight that's appropriate for your strength level and mobility, very safe. It's a perfectly safe exercise. But it's one of those exercises where if you deviate outside of that, especially because of the potential for load, now the risk uh, of injury goes up considerably. And oftentimes when people don't know how to do this right or use a wrong weight or don't have good technique and good stability, it's the low back uh, that ends up paying uh, the price. So make sure you have a core that's mm -hmm. stable and strong. You don't want to deadlift after you know, you just had a baby necessarily where you, you need to get those, the connection back or you just had some kind of surgery or whatever. You don't feel like you can't activate your core. Like you want to be able to activate that. You're also highlighting one of my favorite parts uh, about learning and getting good at deadlifting is it's incredible for developing the core. Oh yeah. Because in order for you to hinge the hips like we're talking about, keep those three contact points that Justin's talking about, you have to keep a very neutral spine mm -hmm. while you do that. In order to keep a really neutral spine, you have the core muscles that wrap around that spine and in order to keep it rigid and tight it works like this vacuum where it sucks in and it tightens up around the spine to keep it that way so if you learn to hinge properly you're already getting core activation if you then load that movement you have to strengthen that and as you continue to increase weight on the bar the core is just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger which is hence why you have it bulletproofs the low back everybody every doctor anybody who's ever had low back pain what does the doctor almost always default to work your core right? right train your core so if one of the best ways to develop and strengthen your core is getting a really strong heavy deadlift well that's one of the best ways to bulletproof your low back yeah totally. and you're teaching it and to like repeat these patterns whenever there's a, a opportunity for a heavy load it's like it's like this automatic response that's why we train and we do repetitions with it uh with that type of good form where you're bracing and you're going down and so it's like that way when it's presented to you you're not going to be in a relaxed position where you're compromising your spine. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about priming. Uh, people would refer to this maybe as warm up. We don't like the term warm up because uh, priming is more specific. Priming is helping you to connect to the muscles that you need to connect to, giving you the kind of mobility that's required for the type of exercise you're going to do. Um, and so these are, we're going to go over some general priming movements that you could do before you deadlift. That will apply to most people. Now, the best priming is always individualized. But for most people, these ones will help uh, quite a bit. Now, the first one, I like this a lot for a deadlift. I would do this a lot with clients, uh, was prone cobra. Prone, prone cobra really helps a person activate uh, and, and get in touch with the muscles that tighten the back, that squeeze the shoulder blades back, that stick the chest out. Mm -hmm. It really helps them feel what it feels like to be able to activate that upper posterior chain, right? To brace and strengthen and tighten. So a, a good few sets of prone cobra, I think, uh, tends to set that up. Yeah, no, I like that. I like combat stretch and then a supine scorpion like that. And really like with those, obviously ankle mobility uh, is important and uh, just getting good foot control activation. And then the supine scorpion with the the hips, getting the hips yep. like woke up. It's yeah. real. So like, and I've sup sometimes it's been supine scorpion. Sometimes it's been ninety ninety. Sometimes it's some sometimes leg swings. We'll do windmill to get the yeah, windmill. Type there you go. Of, yeah. yeah, rotational. And all of them stability. are doing something similar, and that's kind of really waking up and activating all those stabilizer muscles yes. in your hips, which are extremely important when you are heavy deadlifting. One of the common injuries you see somebody is to see you're lifting a heavy barbell and there's a little bit of shift in those hips. That's when you hear those QL issues going yes. on or low back stuff that people will have a problem because so side to side. Shift. And and a lot of that is just because they didn't prime. They didn't prime and wake the hips up and get them firing and activated before they go into this big heavy movement. And so I think any of those that we just listed are a, a you know good to add into your arsenal. Now something like a supine scorpion, the average person might look at that and think, oh, that's a twisting stretch on the floor. No, no, no. You have to bring your leg over. Mm -hmm. You have to bring your leg back using your core and your body. If you just sit in a stretch, you actually might set yourself up for more of a uh, risk of injury. You want to be able to activate and fire muscles that rotate you at the lumbar, a little bit at the thoracic, wake up the QL, wake up the erector spinae muscles, a little bit of hip activation. You have to move yourself through it. That's what priming is. It's not holding a stretch. Holding a stretch, not a good idea. That goes for the combat stretch as well. If you look at yeah, that, it looks like you're just, you're just down there stretching. No, you're not. When you get down there, you want to try and pull the toes back with your with your own strength, right? Or push down, activate all those muscles in that position so that they 
actually help you stabilize. You don't want to turn them off. Yeah, it's and I think a lot of people might be going like, well, combat stretch, that's doesn't you don't really need a lot of um ankle mobility for a deadlift, right? You're more in a stiff, rigid position. It's not like the, not quite like the squat, sure. right? But you also get the benefits because it is an active stretch of waking up all the muscles yep. in the foot and ankle. Like that's important. And when you are grounded, like one of the things, one of the cues you'll hear is like grip the floor with your feet, like mm -hmm. be grounded or drive your heels through the floor. When you get into that combat stretch and you activate, you wake up all those muscles, mm -hmm. get those primed. So there's a lot of benefit to doing the combat stretch before you go to deadlift, even though it doesn't seem like it'd be one of those exercises you and would. Your, your feet are anchoring you. I mean, that's that's where you're able to, if you get really good at uh, that type of a cue where you're really grounding yourself good, you got that strength in your feet, you can increase your force production Tremendous. substantially. And so yeah. it's like you can lift more weight. So it starts at the feet. 100%. All right. So here's some things to kind of pay attention to. Uh, trainers would call these cues. Uh, but really just things you want to pay attention to when you're doing an exercise like this. Uh, we talked about hinging. So you, you want to be able to pay attention to be able to hinge back, stick your butt back, bend your knees as you go down. That's the, the, the deadlift itself. You want your arms to be totally straight. Okay. When you start the lift, this is a cue that a lot of people mess up. A lot up. of people mess up because they'll start the lift with the arms slightly bent and then mm -hmm. they'll try to pop up and that slack, that little bit of pop, that's where injuries start to happen. So lock yeah. your arms out. You want no slack in your arms when you're about to lift the weight. Um, I also like to yeah. tell people to activate their lats. What does that look like? Pull your shoulder blades down and back, like you're like doing this. Bending the and bar. also, like, yeah, yes. you imagine you're bending it uh, outward yeah. uh, in a sense, but obviously you're gripping it tight and you're just kind of putting that pressure there. Yeah, so. you're essentially you're starting in a tight, safe position when you're about to lift the weight uh, off the floor. The bar should be over midfoot. That's the starting position. Mm -hmm. um, now, some people will feel like they're hitting their shins when they come up. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not something necessarily you should aim for, um, but there's nothing wrong with that. Some people do that, but it, you want to start with the bar over the midfoot. If it's too far in front of you, uh, now you're using too, you're, you're bending over too much. If it's too close to you, oftentimes with people, depending on their leverage and their body type, it looks like they're do doing a squat, not necessarily. Well, uh, you're a little bit more, you're, you're flirting with inefficiency yes. because the bar line, the bar path actually matters in, in terms of lifting something heavy. You want the straightest line possible to get from point A to point B. Wait, by the way, that I forget the name of the app. Bar path. Is that the name of the app? Oh, I think yeah, that's I think. such a valuable tool for that exact point that you're, that you're talking about right now, because that it, you can line the phone up and it'll show you that bar path before I pull. Um, I really, what takes the slack at the bar, the slack on Mars. I like to have like, a, I'll get in my position where my hips are supposed to be and my lats locked all in. And then I'll get kind of like this little jerk on the bar yeah. just so I could feel the slack come out of my yeah. arms, the slack come out of the bar. I, you want everything because this is a, a, a lever type of exercise, right? It's not, you're not picking the bar up, you're leveraging the bar up. You want everything to be so tight, tight and rigid before. You don't want any slack. You want to feel tightness in your in your hips and butt before you go. You want to feel tightness in your arms. You want to feel tightness in your lats. Everything should feel rigid, and then you're just firing those hips in, forward. In fact, when I deadlift, I'm before I do the lift, I'm lifting 10 pounds off the bar anyway. I don't start from zero to whatever because otherwise it looks like a pop. Mm -hmm. You're not popping the weight up, okay? Uh, that's That's a totally different type of lift. Uh, you are lifting the weight and you want it to start from a good clean position. So even before I go for a lift, there's probably 10 pounds of, of lift already on the bar yeah. that I've already produced. Yeah. You like, to, I love when you see kind of a little bit of a, a bend you in the bar before yeah. the bar comes yes. up. Yep, yep. You want to be able to really feel that. You know, what it reminds me of is, um, I don't know if you guys have ever like gone to a drag racing event and been in the pit or you see how these cars kind of warm up before they yeah. really like, you know, punch it. Uh, yeah. Well, they, they spin them out, they warm the tires up and all that, and they kind of roll back up to the line. Well, they have to they have to have one foot on the acceleration. It's already, the, the foot pedal's already going, mm. and it's on the brakes at the same time, keeping it from, so it from just lurching goes. forward, so yeah. it just goes. Yeah. And that's right. kind of how I look at that. Yeah. Um, also, another cue is to, rather than lift the bar, imagine you're holding onto the bar and you're pushing your legs through the floor. Yeah. Uh, this just helps with the technique of a lift. Uh, this has helped a lot of my clients. When I watch their form and I tell them this cue, all of a sudden, it just looks a lot better. Um, and it helps me too. When I'm going for my heavy lifts, sometimes that's that old vision that I'm just pushing my legs through the floor. Yeah, I mean, one of my yep. once you get into the position, which I think is one of the hardest things, is to get in the perfect, proper position. Once you're there, then the cue of driving the heels to the floor, 
thrusting the hips forward to me is the best cue. Yes. It's like that. That is exactly what you're doing. You are pushing your heels in the floor and thrusting the hips forward, and that's what lifts that and bar, up. bar up. And there's a tr there's a lot of value. We didn't talk or list this, but there's so much value in when you kind of figure this out is to create a ritual. And I know there's a lot of people like like that tease like our friend Lane Norton the way he comes <laughs> way he up and stuff bar. like that. <laughs> I, the reason why I don't talk shit and tease him because I complete one hundred like. Yeah. If you ever watched a a baseball player, mm -hmm. a golfer, anybody comes up, these are all very technical uh, sports, technical movements. To, to swing a baseball bat at 100 mile an hour baseball is unbelievably, anything, yeah. to hit a golf ball this small, 300 something yards, incredibly technical. And so these guys create these rituals on how they walk up to the plate, how they walk up to the ball. So, and it just helps you get into that perfect position. And so there is a lot of value and I don't care if it's quirky or people make fun of you. If it helps you get into all these cues that we just said, do it and mm -hmm. do it the same every time it will help you at over time because before you know it, you'll be able to just get right in that movement just by kind of doing your ritual, no. which is where I'm at in my life now, 100%. but it took me years to get there. hundred percent. All right. Some common errors, right? The most common one is a rounded lower back. Mm. Your low back should stay neutral. Now notice I said lower back, the upper mid back can have some rounding. You will see some rounding oftentimes in a experienced deadlifter in that kind of thoracic area. That's mm -hmm. fine. It's the low back you want to have maintained strong and stable. Now, experienced lifters sometimes will have a little bit of rounding, but what they're not doing is rounding to their end range of motion. Now, beginning lifters, intermediate lifters, you want to maintain neutral yeah, low back. You do not want any, possible. any rounding whatsoever. I think a good that. example is to compare your deadlift and my deadlift. Yeah. I think you have a, you have that kind of upper rounded back when you go in, and it's not bad. For, you see that you still stay neutral the entire right. way. There's no movement going on there. It's just you, the way your posture starts. You start. Uh, Jordan Shallow does it too, really. Well. You can see Jordan Shallow really accentuate his rounding mm -hmm. as he comes over before he he rolls the bar up. So that's just like, to me, that's like a, tech, you know, a technique that certain lifters lifters like doing it that way. As long as there is no movement in that low back, you're completely fine doing that. That's yes. what you want to see rigid. Another issue is sometimes the hips will come up too fast. Yeah. They'll do the lift and they'll lift their butt and then they'll lift the bar. Right. You want the bar to come up with your butt and your knees to come up at the same time. So you want knees and hips and bar to move at the same time. So you've got this nice smooth motion. You don't want a two stage deadlift that totally changes the exercise and increases yeah. risk of injury. You want to drive it up. It almost seems like they forget to pull mm -hmm. uh, at the same time as they're really focused on really driving their legs up to get that locking out position. So this is a challenge sometimes for me, and I think sometimes taller people with this, the hips rising first. And a lot of that is you you go through the motion of taking the slack out of the bar, the slack out of your arms, but you don't take the slack out of your hamstrings and your glutes. Mm. So that's the load the, those and get tight. That's yeah, you got to load. load. So that's what's going on there. You've taken the slack out of your arms, you take the slack out of the bar, your lats are all active, you're all tight up front, but then your hips aren't tight, your hamstrings aren't tight yet. So you want to let those hips rise up to where the hamstrings and the glute they're super tight first. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, it's all thrusting forward. If there's any slack there, that what will happen is when you first initiate the movement, the Pop hips up will, a little bit. The, yeah, the hips will come up to get rid of the slack, and then you'll you'll see the deadlift. And it's just this slight little shift in a cue or your starting position by sliding the hips back or letting them come up a tiny bit and getting that slack out of the hamstring. Yeah. Um, the other one, this was not as common, but you'll still see this sometimes, is people will squat too low. Where the butt is so low that you'll notice that their arms are not, you should have a straight line from your shoulders down to your hands. Mm -hmm. If your shoulders are further back than your hands, you're squatting too low. And you've yeah. changed the bar path and your, made it less. Your leverage is helpful. Though. Yeah. Right. And so it's less common, um, but if you see it, you know it. So you want that straight line. Shoulders to hands should this, be completely straight. This is common in uh, watching a bodybuilder do a deadlift for the first time. Mm -hmm. They want to squat the bar up. Yeah. They pick, they want to pick it up. And that's yep. where, like, that's, they're not under understanding the leverage or the way you're trying to create a lever for deadlifting. And that's, so if you are dropping your hips too low, what you're thinking or what you're doing typically wrong is you're thinking about picking the bar up. Right. You are not picking the bar up in a deadlift. You are, le you're leveraging it up. And so that thought process is different. That's normally where these people are off is they're visually looking at someone lift the bar up and they think that person's picking the bar up off. They're, they're, they're like trying to muscle it up. With That's right. And it's a, it's a very bodybuilder. 
Yeah, a little as, bit of slack in their elbow, and then you know, and then it's a bicep heavy exercise mm-hmm. at that point. It's all problematic. Yeah, and then another one is you see some shifting from side to side. Now, if this happens to you, go lighter and slow down. That's just the bottom line. If it keeps happening to you, practice one legged versions of this and find out what side is so much stronger than the other and try to balance them out. But shifting left to right on a deadlift is an injury waiting to happen. Oh, yeah. So if that happens, take it seriously because that's probably, aside from a super rounded lower back, probably the most common reason why somebody hurts themselves on a deadlift is yeah, that would, the, they get agree. the shifting. I mean, that's where I've hurt myself. Yep. Yeah. And, and, a, and a lot of that is, you know, you, it's common because guys, that, guys and girls that get really strong in the sagittal plane are lifting, you know, deadlifting, squatting, just doing that. They neglect multi-planar movements and they don't have a lot of stability mm-hmm. from left to right. Mm-hmm. And so, or unilateral work, they don't do as much. And so all, that's all it takes is a little bit of shift to the left or right. They have no strength and stability there. They're holding on to 500 pounds. So it doesn't take much for something yeah. to go. Yeah. And again, this stresses the importance of focus as well. That's the reason why I injured myself with that was just there was something going on over to the right of me. And so my focus went over there oh, and no. there was a shift and then sh- tried to overcorrect. And then, yes, it was all bad. Look so, straight ahead. Look That's, straight ahead. Yes. Focus completely on the task. At yes. A hundred percent. Actually, we didn't even, t- we didn't talk about that. That's actually a common mistake too. When people deadlifts is they look up and they arch their neck. You should actually keep your chin tucked as you come yeah. down. So you're forward and tucked yeah. as you deadlift up. A common mistake is people look up as they deadlift and you actually want to keep the chin tucked as you, yeah, as you at the deadlift. most look straight ahead, but don't yeah. do this up, up, yeah. uh, you know, look up. Oh thing. yeah. Don't do that. Now when you're deadlifting, take your time, take your time and slowly work yourself up, uh, to your work set. The stronger you are, the longer this should take. Give yourself time to work up to your heavy sets. This is a, uh, don't try to rush through this so you can do other exercises for two reasons. One, it's a complex lift, but two, this exercise is so effective. It takes the place of, four or five other exercises combined. So if you, if you don't, if you don't have enough time to do these other movements, mm. it's totally fine. The deadlift did, uh, brought you more value anyway. So slowly work your way up. Um, this is also one of those lifts where uh, there are rep ranges that tend to work better for it. Yeah. Low reps tend to work better yeah. for a deadlift than high reps. Now that's not to say you can't do high reps, but high reps with the low back starts to get fatigued, form starts to break down much faster, low reps. when I say low reps, it's like anywhere between one to like eight, tends to be better with the deadlift than with with other exercises. I mean, I to the extreme even, right? That um it's one of the few exercises uh that I've ever trained in my life where I might do a day of nothing but singles or doubles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of exercises that I would go to the gym and go, "Oh, today I'm going to I'm going to do nothing more than two reps of this of with a bunch of sets, right? I'll do six yeah. sets." of doubles or triples there's not a lot of other exercises maybe the squat i do that but the squat definitely not even as much as i would deadlift is one of the few movements where there's a lot of value in training singles just practicing doubles, and triples. yeah just practicing lifting really heavy one or two reps um for lots of sets it's got it gives you a lot of bang for your buck well i mean fatigue obviously that's going to play a factor with your mechanics and how that's going to affect that but also to my earlier point of focus like if you have you know a drawn out amount of reps let's say like anything over 10 at that point you're just going to kind of try to feel like you're getting in the zone however this lift isn't the greatest for uh not being present yeah. let's just say like you have to account for all of these moving parts because it's it has that bit of a risk factor too. Yeah. Now, for the most part, we have, we tell people to avoid lifting to failure just across the board. We only have really one program where we program in failure. There is a, a proper way to do it, but uh, go, deadlifts to failure, almost always a bad idea. There's definitely cases and advanced people that can do this, but it's an exercise where if your form deviates, you know, a few degrees outside of perfect, the risk factor starts to go up too high. And going to failure, that type of intensity the deviations and forms become much more common. So it's just, it's one of those movements you probably don't want to go to failure on more than other exercises. No, that's where yeah. this where the single double triple advice comes in. What this looks like is pick a weight that's heavier than what you can do five reps for and then practice singles and doubles. With that's it. it. Yep. Like there, that's how you're going to get some really good value from that. And then you're, you're training at a higher, a higher volume and a more weight than you're used to training with. Uh, with an exercise and you're just reducing the amount of uh, reps. So, and you'll see strength go up like crazy. That's right. That. This is also an exercise. And there are versions where you don't necessarily do this, 
But for most people, most, most of your value is going to come from pausing the weight on the floor every rep. Okay. So there mm -hmm. are touch and go deadlifts and you'll see some people do these for most people. Yeah. It's better, uh, just across the board results, risk of injury, all that stuff. I tend to, to avoid the touch and go. Yeah. Was, I, was touch and go ever a thing before CrossFit? Uh, yeah. Bodybuilders would do touch and go sometimes and some power lifters would do it. Uh, but it wasn't a staple. It really wasn't. A yeah, I don't remember. See, I, it got popular with CrossFit because yeah, CrossFit they did, for sure did. Yeah, because they, they do all for time. They do a lot do like of deadlift, ladder. Uh, where yeah, they, they do a, a lot of, of ladder work. They do a lot of uh, deadlifting stuff in circuits and for time, and so that's where you see a lot of touch and go. But I, I never taught touch and go. Mm -hmm, I don't. There's not either. a lot of benefit to doing touch and go that you're going to get that's greater than actually pausing between each rep. And, and a pause looks like this: you you bring the weight down to the floor. Set it on the floor for yeah. like three, four, five, ten seconds, it and then lift it back up. Again. Literally, sit it on the floor. That's the that's yeah. where the term "dead" and "deadlift" comes from. So it's not like hit the floor, come yeah. up. That's yeah. actually it the touch and go. Shouldn't have any movement <laughs> no, at all. Burn it, just, it down. It's just pause. Completely stone cold. Get stop. your yes. Get your technique. Get your form. Tighten your lats. Brace your core. Get in position. Lift it again. And by the way, for the people that are going, that might be thinking, oh well, what about you know the time and our attention and the value that you get from that? I mean, that's what the Romanian deadlifts for. That's why you do an exercise like that where you where you yeah, are you're point. keeping consistent tension on that exercise. Save that constant tension through yeah. the reps for a movement like a Romanian deadlift, but a conventional or a sumo deadlift, there, I think there's more value setting the bar down, resetting, and then and then learning to explode it off the ground. Totally. Now, uh, how many days a week should you deadlift? For most people, one day a week, but you can do two days a week. But if you do two days a week, one should be hard and one should be easy. I, I don't think it's a good idea to he heavy deadlift twice a week. I don't know very many people that could do that for very long without overtraining. It's one of the most taxing exercises uh, on the body. And it tax, you know, squats, people say barbell squats. They are taxing, but I could barbell squat way more frequently than I can deadlift. Deadlifts, ugh, that's that's one where if I go too often, it starts to hurt my body oh, yeah. in, in a different way. I, so. You know, when when I was chasing after you and I made the, the greatest gains in my deadlift, I was deadlifting twice a week. And it was one day was a very heavy day. One day was a technique day. Yeah. So one day I would push the weight. I would really get after it, really stretch myself. Then towards the end of the week or so, or about three days later, I would do it again. And when I did it again, this was higher rep, much lighter load. And it was like, like, like bar speed and stuff like yeah, that. I would yep. start to work on bar techniques speed, or this might be, bands. yeah, this might be, I know we're going to talk about the advanced oh, right. techniques. This is where I would get into chains, bands and, and, and things like this or deficit deads mm -hmm. or things like that is like the second day a week would be much lighter load and utilizing tools like that. Yeah. So for advanced lifters who are trying to get past plateaus, you're already pretty strong. You've been practicing the deadlift for a while. Bands are phenomenal at giving you that kind of progressive resistance. Chains also give you progressive resistance. They're just more damaging on the body. I prefer bands overall, but you can also use chains. And then de deficit deadlifts are great for people who uh, have a sticking point on the floor. What is a deficit deadlift? You're literally standing on like a plate or instead of using 45s to say use 35, so the bar's lower. You have to get lower to lift the bar. Now I will caution people with a deficit deadlift, Go much lighter than you think if isn't if this isn't something that you've practiced very often. It is that extra four inches of range of motion don't maybe don't seem like that much. They're a lot. It's a lot, especially when it comes to safety. So go much lighter when you're doing those deficit deadlifts. And then lastly would be speed deads. And speed deads literally uh, the way you and speed deadlifts are not touch and go. I've seen people do this. Oh, speed deadlifts. I'm going to bounce the bar. No, no, no. Speed deadlift is you get a lightweight, you get tight, you get ready, and then you come up with really good control power. It's all acceleration. Yeah, yeah, at the top. Speed deadlifts with bands have been one of my favorite ways to increase my strength in deadlift. I, oh, because it's, my favorite. You're working on technique. You got a light enough load, so the risk isn't isn't as high. And learning to rip the bar off the ground uh, faster and more efficiently. Uh, really carries over into the, just that when you get to that heavy loaded is because a lot of that is that ability to call upon that all and summon all that strength and that instant to get that bar off that. And I think banded speed pulls is like yeah. one of my favorite. And then it loads there. the strongest part of the lift. That's right. So yeah, it's the less risky uh, way to do these speed right. lifts. Totally. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to Mind Pump Media on Instagram and for under $5 a month, you'll get a workout set up for you. We actually post workouts Every week there, under $5 a, a month. It's pretty awesome. You can also find all of us uh, individually on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.